We have a guest joining us now in the studio. Professor Pielo Lumumba <coughs> is our guest. Good morning, Prof. Good morning. Karibu sana to Kenya's biggest conversation. It's good to have you here. What does PLO stand Patrick for? Patrick Lodge Otieno Lumumba. Patrick Lodge Otieno. Correct. Lumumba. Mm. Ask him what Lodge means. What does Lodge mean? Lodge can mean many things. Uh -huh. Context defined. Uh -huh. It can mean victory, it can mean independence. And pronounced as Lodge, it also means a tither. The Lua language is Tono. It's Tono. So Lodge and Lodge are different. <laughs> Spell uh, the same. Spell the same. Mm. Lodge or Lodge. Yeah. Uh, but yours is Lodge. Lodge. Patrick Lodge. <laughs> Otieno Lumumba. Karibu yeah. sana. Asante sana. C.T. Muga. <laughs> <laughs> not Lodge. <laughs> C.T. Lodge. Muga. <laughs> Muga, not Muga. Yeah. Not Muga. <laughs> <laughs> He's here yeah. and here's the day's proverb. Mm -hmm. Yes, our mm -hmm. proverbs for the whole of this week are from the country of Somalia. Mm. Okay. Yeah. One man marries a woman, another man marries troubles. One man marries a woman, another man marries <laughs> troubles. <laughs> of, is he the same man? <laughs> <laughs> or is it the same woman? <laughs> 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 the woman who's married second time around. <laughs> it's a very loaded uh, <laughs> proverb, <laughs> subject to many interpretations. <laughs> What's yours? What's your interpretation of it? I think it could be the same woman, mm -hmm. and she's a package which could be a good good woman or a bad woman. Mm -hmm. But why don't we talk about the man being good <laughs> or being bad? <laughs> uh, it's not very gender sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> that will be another proverb yes. for another day. Yes. Today's proverb looks at this this way. Uh, prof, you came in with documents. Dora, come on, guys. I want you to read. Uh, prof, you came in with documents. Dora, come on, guys. I want you to read. City, mm -hmm. this is for you. You, you, you consume that. Okay. I'm consuming this, yes. which is an editorial that um, the then editor of for the Advocate. Uh, in November 1992, the editor was P.L. Mumba for The Advocate magazine. Tell us about The Advocate magazine. The Advocate magazine <coughs> was a magazine of the Law Society of Kenya. I think <coughs> it still runs. Yes. And you will remember that 1992 was the time when we were talking about multi-party politics. And we were active at that time. And we were speaking to the politicians of the day, Kenneth Njindo Matiba, Rubia, Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga, Daniel Arab Moy, and we were headed to the elections. Yep. And the Law Society was at the heart of it with my good friend and uh, former master Paul Kivugi Mwite, uh, Gibson Kamau Kuria. M Mutunga had gone to study at Osgood and therefore was the chairman in absentia. And mm. we were urging peace mm. because the population was being weaponized from an ethnic standpoint and you can see in my editorial i'm urging them that even if you lose an election yep you've got to accept defeat because the nation is larger than losing an election let me just read some of the words in this uh, editorial that you wrote it starts with a word to all participants in kenya's arena of political transition peace and a word is enough to the wise and it says Kenya moves closer to the inauguration of its first multi-party parliamentary parliament. Tension reigns high. And we're just gonna skip a certain uh, a couple of lines here and say one thing is certain: when Kenyans called for change, they knew what they wanted. If the outcome of the process of change displeases some, it is because not all Kenyans wanted change. And the best way to contain the shock of the outcome is to be democratic in mind. Live and let live others. The other thing that Kenyans would want to see in the post-election period is the profit of the second liberation struggle. Such profit cannot be achieved unless all Kenyans accept the results of free and fair elections. Kenya cannot progress without peace. Victors of the elections cannot fulfill their promises to the electorate unless they are given a peaceful atmosphere to operate. Losers, on the other hand, can only win the hearts of the electorate by their humble acceptance of their defeat. Any act of violence to recapture leadership from the winners will neither profit the contenders nor benefit the electorate. We should all realize that it is not the installation of democratic leaders that Kenyans have been calling for, 
but the restoration the restoration and restructuring of democratic institutions that will ensure that the liberties and freedoms of Kenyans are secure construction of greater foundations of democracy and democratization of our institutions will overly depend on how much peaceful our nation remains after the elections let every Kenyan's clarion call be peace and as the new term now moves nigh may peace be with us all the number of times that you've used the word peace oh yeah because there is nothing greater than peace I, I when you read that document i remember another famous speech by john f kennedy about peace in 1960 <laughs> says without peace there is nothing even war ends with peace there is nothing greater than peace and mm. calm in and of itself is not peace it is a Peace means that there is acceptance of the environment and that environment must be an environment that favors all or the critical mass and it must be an environment that is informed by accommodation and understanding. That is what I meant and I still mean today. A month later, Kenyans went to the polls and the results were declared. Did, do you think the leaders heeded your call? No, they did not. In 97, <laughs> did they? <laughs> In 1992, and I remember at that time, even as a young lawyer, I was in the court on behalf of the Law Society of Kenya, mm -hmm. holding brief when the Kenneth Stanley Njinto Matiba had challenged the election of Daniel Moy. Ultimately, of course, the court did declare that Moy was properly elected, and Njinto Matiba, to his credit, mm said i do not accept the judgment of the court but democracy not only requires of me but it demands of me that i accept the result and i accept them as they are and i spoke to njindo matiba and i remember and he said young man the country is bigger than me hmm. prof if, as you look at the demands and the requirements of democracy there have been many calls, whether they've been in Kenya or calls outside of Kenya, around the world, for a restructuring of democracy and what that actually means. People have started to question the tenets upon which democracy was built or even imagined. In this article as well, in 1992, you talk about, we should realize that it is not the installation of democratic leaders that Kenya, and have, Kenya has been calling for, but the restoration and restructuring of democratic institutions that will ensure that the liberties and freedoms of Kenyans are secure. In fact, <laughs> I no longer use the term democracy much okay. because I think it misrepresents what we want. I think the Westerners, particularly after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, came and told us that democracy means, one, you must have multi-party politics. Two, you must have periodic elections. Three, you must have a civil society. I now use the word governance more. Okay. The word governance, in my view, is one that is capable of addressing the specificities of a different country. Look at your typical post-colonial African state. They are multi-ethnic. And because they are multi-ethnic, there are certain things and considerations that you put into account that would not make sense in a mono-ethnic country such as Denmark. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, if you permit me, a country like South Sudan. Mm -hmm. It has five mm -hmm. vice presidents. It doesn't make sense on the face of it. Yep. But in order to preserve the nation, that which does not make sense, makes sense in that environment. And if you read my good friend Koigi Waamwere's book toward genocide in Kenya, The Curse of Negative Ethnicity, Koigi actually identifies this because look at our country, Kenya. We talk about political parties, but are they political parties in the classical sense? No. All the political players now that you see and have been around, each one of them has belonged to at least six political parties or formations, mm -hmm. which means they believe in no ideology. Mm -hmm. These, what we have in Kenya, are just ethnic clubs or personality cultism. And the sooner we realize that governance must now address those specificities, the safer we are. And we can build institutions that do that. Mm. We can build institutions that actually recognize that these ethnic realities must be accommodated just for the feel-good effect. Mm -hmm. Somebody who has never met an individual from his village is happy that his villager is a prime minister. Mm. 
Yeah. Just feel good. <laughs> and the country is the safer and is safer because of it. Somebody says we now have ministers. He'll never meet that minister, but they feel good. So governance mm. is what I am urging for and it must be one that addresses our specificities. And Kenya now, for the moment, is so deeply ethnicized mm. that what we call political parties are ethnic arrangements. And when you see coalitions, they are ethnic coalitions complete with uh, personality cults. Yeah. That is why when the, the cult leader moves from one formation to the other, all his followers move with him or her. So in the pursuit of peace, mm -hmm. which still is topmost of the agenda, especially for words that you've used, mm -hmm then wouldn't it be necessary, based on the definitions that we've applied to governance, taking into consideration these specific specificities of mm. individuals mm. or political parties mm. or governance or leadership, in the pursuit of peace, then must all of these things not be taken into consideration, regardless of what side you are? Because we are on a battle of sides here. In Kenya's current position, in Kenya's current situation, if the pursuit of peace is the end goal, must all of these things not then be taken into consideration for a new governance to be defined? Of course. If you ignore them, you ignore them at the country's peril. That is the reality. And that is why I am of the view right now that one of the things that we need very urgently, and we will be starting a, a, a popular initiative ourselves in the not too distant future, is to rethink our constitutional order. Mm. We must rethink our constitutional order and ask ourselves what do we really want as a country knowing as we do that we are an ethnicized uh, country and that we have these political parties. Must we not therefore in the nature of things address all these things? Mm -hmm. When for example my people, the Luoth, say they are marginalized, why are they saying that? Why are the Kambas saying they are marginalized? Why are the Trukana say they are marginalized? When we were doing the constitution, we thought the devolution could address some of those issues yeah. so that the devolved units could actually address many of the critical issues of governance and then the center would remain very lean to deal with defense, to deal with foreign affairs, to deal with policy coordination. But the devolution model we, we ended up with is, is one that is failing us because mm. first of all the revolution units are too many so in a nutshell i'm saying the time is now to have a honest no holds barred conversation mm. what we are seeing now in the terms of negotiations are necessary but that is in my view just a truce so that we can stabilize. Once we have stabilized, we've got to get into serious negotiations for the future of the nation and ask difficult questions. As mm. I conclude answering your question, the Swiss answered that question. Mm -hmm. If you go to Switzerland, and many of you will be familiar, you have the German speaking, the Italian speaking, the French speaking, and the Romansh speaking. And they recognize that reality, and the constitution is actually made in recognition of those realities. Even when you are constituting cabinet, yeah. it may indeed be necessary that you do a cabinet that accommodates all these ethnicities, even if you have uh, <laughs> to 20 five of them then you have permanent secretaries that now accommodate the other ethnicities without sacrificing meritocracy and all ethnicities now actually do have men and women who can serve but the sooner we are honest and say that and that is why i take umbrage when i hear my vice deputy president saying that there is a government of shares no once we have <laughs> voted for you, you are now the president mm. and the deputy president of all of us, whether we voted for you or not. And we are entitled to serve in government. Mm. Need for a conversation around our constitution. Prof, when I hear you and when I read this, I think the first message that really screams at me is the need for political maturity. Yes. The maturity of the winners to recognize that they have gotten mandate from the people yes. and the maturity of the losers to recognize that the winners have been given mandate mm -hmm. and to therefore embrace peace yes so everything else that comes thereafter yes. will be on the basis of first of all there was that maturity of the process has taken place however it has gone yes i may like matiba says i may not like what has come out mm -hmm. but i have got to accept it and then thereafter we have another conversation but if you look at so 92 
whatever happened happened 97 whatever happened happened if you look at our politics since then those 30 years and the six elections do you think the political players actually have that maturity no they don't and in fact i've written a book about calling for political hygiene in kenya the second edition is called sanitizing kenyan politics hmm. what we now have are individuals in the political arena and they are the same individuals we've worked with them hmm. whose desire for political office knows no bound knows no decency they want to acquire political power by hook or crook one of the things that made me very glad when President Uhuru Kenyatta lost the election, he conceded, and I loved it. Openly and publicly. Yes, and, and you can see how it helped the first NAC administration, how the Kibaki administration then went into office and the opposition was playing its rightful role. But after that, we went into 2007 which of course led to a near civil war in this country and which, as you know, led to many things. And ultimately, we went into an arrangement where there were uncomfortable partners, 2013, no concession, 2017, no concession, and this election, no concession. And you see the disrespect for institutions. When, for example, you've gone to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has made a finding against you, you stop there because it is good for the nation but unfortunately our politicians now once they have ignored the institution they now go to the mob and there is something called ochlocracy mm -hmm. rule by the mob mm -hmm. you now want to govern from the streets by st threatening people that is not good so th in a nutshell there is no political maturity the political leaders weaponize their their constituencies from an ethnic standpoint and the idea is to disrupt and I think that is very unfortunate. And, and you just have to listen to the political rally, see how vulgar people are. Indiscipline has become a badge of honor in this country. And that is tragic. And the net effect is that the country is the poorer. You now see even investors are migrating to our other sister countries because our environment is toxic. So the first thing you want to do is to morally rearm the political leadership, mm. to introduce hygiene into our politics, and to ensure that the political parties we have are actual political parties. They are not. How do you do that, Prof? Because I have to ask, you, yeah. you, 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 alluded, you alluded to that before. Yeah. We know. Yeah. Right now, political parties, aside from how they've originally been envisioned, mm -hmm. are essentially vehicles for an individual, for expediency, for position. How do you re-engineer a practice that has been there for so long? How? Uh, practically, how do you actually say, all right, let's re-engineer morals. Let's re-engineer political practice. Let's re-engineer all of this. How does that it can begin? Be done. You remember in 1966 when Oginga Odinga at that time uh, left... Uh, uh, Kanu to join KPU, something was introduced called the Tan Court Rule. Mm. If you are a member of a political party and you abandon that party mainstream, you go back to the electorate mm. so that you don't engage in political conmanship where you, you, you're on one side, you, you hunt with the wolves and also graze with the sheep. And, and I think that those are the kind of things that ought to be done. The very idea of the political parties fund was actually meant to strengthen political parties. But there must be punishment of individuals who, engage, who are turn courts. And if you do that consistently and the parties have structure, over a period of time will grow these parties. Let's not judge ourselves too harshly. Mm. When we say too long, how long? Mm. I mean, <laughs> in the life of a nation, even a hundred years is very short. Yeah. And, and if you look at it in that way, then there will progressively be maturity in those political parties. They'll be ideologically founded. And in Africa, we have seen political parties of that kind. If you look at Tanu and Afro Shirazi that created Chama Chama Pinduzi, Chama Chama Pinduzi is a political party. Mm -hmm. And C is a political party. You yep. can see when you misbehave, they recall you. For you know limo. They stand for. Yes, and you know what they stand for. Mm -hmm. But look at these formations in Kenya that we call political parties. What do they stand for? Zero. They stand for pursuit of power yep. by any means necessary. necessary. And the net effect is that you can never identify them with an alternative political agenda. Let's look at, for example, a question of the cost of living. What I would have expected the opposition as constituted in parliament 
during the debate, for example, of the finance bill, is an article by article opposition with an alternative formulation. I would have expected their own alternative agenda how we deal with the cost of living. Mm. But what do you see? The parliamentarians are shouting in streets. They are shouting at political rallies and they are not debating in parliament. Because if you, have a, if, if you are a Zimio, for example, in Kenya and you are Kenya Kwanzaa, you have your agenda of mm. how to deal with this. I want to see robust debate in the National Assembly, robust debate in the Senate about this, so you are defeated or you win and Kenyans see you debating. And that is what makes a political party. We are therefore able to say the Azimio coalition is a welfareist party. Yeah. Which wants to deal with us in health in this way, in taxation in this way. But as it is now, you don't know. And if you listen to some of these players, what they said in 2011, they say the opposite now because it is politically expedient. And political expediency mm. is the destroyer of nations and we can see it now so that every election circle yep. you've got to bring in an external mediator because you can't resolve your own domestic issues shame prof you say that as far as you're concerned our political class has actually never matured yes and i well i think there's sufficient reason to support that particular view but mm. if i look at what they're doing what you describe let me prefer a different perspective mm. and chapter one of our constitution provides the perspective that i want to uh, talk about mm. everything we hear mm -hmm. boils down to the battle that they have for the soul well they call it the vote <laughs> of the populace yes everything mm. So it's like admitting that they've understand, they've understood mm -hmm. what the crafters of our constitution did and then enshrined in the constitution mm -hmm. as to where the real power is. Mm -hmm. Because all these conversations, yes, it highlights all manner of things, but it is about people. Mm -hmm. It may be lies, but it's about people. It may be wild promises, but it's about people. So the question that then we've been asking ourselves in the studio here is perhaps our politicians represent that group of children we refer to as errant children who refuse to grow up mm. <laughs> so if they refuse to grow up is it not then the duty of the parents to help these children grow up and our constitution gives us the one energy that parents role the, the beauty my brother is that I was there when this was being crafted and I can remember almost every other word of the constitution and, and, and that particular provision. It is true. When we said we were going to have a constitution with a preamble, we the people, we said that power reposes in the people and is delegated. Yes. So when they say it is delegated, we are delegating it to institutions, to parliament, including national assembly and senate. It is true that power reposes in the people. But that is the theory of it. The theory is that uh, when you talk about people, it's the collective of all the people and those who is participate. It, is it theory or the aspiration? It, no, it is both theory and aspiration. Because the theory is that there is a class of a group called the people. Mm. That is the theory of constitution is making. It's not the reality that the people actually exist, you know, Professor. It is also a theory. In constitutional making, it is a theory that there is a collectivity of people who are the people themselves. And, and, and it's something that we have written about it. There's a constitution book that we say, who are these people that we keep on talking about? Is it something that you can touch? And these people, when they express themselves through the thing called the vote, when the vote is used in an individual fashion, you vote and I vote, and then we say that that constitutes the people, and that there is a majority of those people whose will must now carry the day, and there is a minority of them who will be the opposition, and they all work towards one end. Mm. Ultimately, that is what it is. Mm. And we say we have delegated to these parliamentarians. And when we say we have delegated, we say we can take it back. And I hear some people in a completely jaundiced interpretation of the Constitution say, we have taken it back. When you take it back, Parliament must cease to exist. Yeah. You cannot claim that you have taken power back and parliamentarians are still working. And the same parliamentarians are saying, we have taken the power back. They must <laughs> all resign en masse. Mm. So the truth be told, and you've said something that I find uh, very ingenious, that 
One, if the politicians are not mature, they are good representation of who we are. And if they are good representation of who we are, it means that the quality of the electorate will determine the quality of the leaders that we elect. Otherwise, what we have is just uh, an assembly of people who, through populism, manage to manipulate the people. Mm. And, and all of us are Kenyans. You listen to some of the speeches that are made by these politicians in mother tongue, in their unguarded moments. Forget the English speeches they make in Nairobi. In their unguarded moments, what they say and they ask the the population rhetorical do you hear what i'm saying yeah and what they are promising them in many ways is when i get power our people will have power yeah and when our people have power manna will fall from heaven mm -hmm. and money honey will flow and milk will flow and that is immaturity of both the electorate the People who are elected as politicians actually feast on this ignorance. Does it and, then not yeah. speak of the electorate? When you were going round with the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission, went round the country collecting views and listening to the people, did the people say the things that translated into the Constitution or were they saying something different? No, I was there. I was the secretary. What I were they the saying? Notes. Yeah. People told us and we asked leading questions. We asked them, one, there is a legislature. What kind of legislature would you want? In their own unsophisticated way, they would tell us, to nataka bunge, we want a bunge which is representative. Mm -hmm. We want a bunge which will ensure that our parliamentarian brings development. Brings and development. Brings development. Mm -hmm. That was the basis of the creation of the constituency fund. Mm -hmm. We don't want the provincial administration which is not elected. We want to elect our people. That is how we came up with devolution. Mm -hmm. We want a judiciary which is responsive to the people. That is why we say the judiciary now represents the people. So it was our own interpretation of what they said in their unsophisticated way. But they spoke. Whether they spoke in their mother tongue or they spoke in English or in Kiswahili, when it came to land tenure system, the object told us, if you give us individual titles, what are we going to do with them? We want communal titles because we are hunters and gatherers. And, and these things then found themselves in the constitution. But remember, mm. the 2010 constitution is not the bombers' constitution. No, it isn't. This is a politician's constitution largely made in Ivasha. Mm. Mm. <laughs> particularly as regards devolution. Particularly as regards the current structure of the presidency. We did not prescribe this because we were dealing with ethnicities. So we said, let us have a parliamentary system. Then the politicians, of course, for reasons that I'll not disclose here, but I know, mm. somebody wanted to be president at that time and was persuaded by another group that if you want to be president, why do you want to be a weak president? <laughs> Take this one. And mm. they took it. The time now is to relook at those things. Remember our earlier conversation. We cannot run away from the fact that we are very ethnic. And we are ethnic and some of this leadership is representational and feel good and that's why my question is yes when you were going around the country and listening to the people mm. were the people saying that i want my tribesman i am electing my tribesman to go and bring me development i want him or her to be in charge of the country to be in to charge be play to play yes. a role at national level yes and i remember in 1992 we were at the bombers of kenya rather at uh, safari park and i asked this question and koigi wamwere supported me i said we are pretending to have political parties why don't we just be honest and we say these are the luhias these are the kambas these are the kikuyus and we are find ourselves in kenya and therefore when we are constituting government we cannot run away from the fact that representation is critical and if we are that honest mm -hmm. we would possibly diffuse many of the tensions that you see because right now you find individuals or communities that think they are marginalized because their sons and daughters are not playing a role. The day their sons and daughters are seen to be occupying even a sinecure office, then they say, now we know. Hmm. Now we can sleep hungry, but we are there.
This is the reality of this country. Ethnicity is so firmly entrenched mm. that unless you see one of your own at Jamhuri Park, say, now this thing is going on and our man is not even there. <laughs> but <laughs> Professor, there is this, you know, we got introduced to a concept yes. in our electoral process, mm -hmm. the tyranny of numbers. Yeah. But there's another tyranny that I think dominates our thinking. It's mm. called the tyranny of habit. Mm -hmm. You see, if over the years, what we think as development of our making our lives better simply has revolved around having one of your own in a position of authority. Mm. Even when the county governments came into being with authority, yes, with funding, somehow that seems to be ignored. <laughs> you know, you are so mm. right. <laughs> because the very thing that people thought they would want, they actually have. They actually have it. One of your own in power with money to do the things that you have wanted them to do. But still, unless and until one sees one of their own in a position of authority at the national government, somehow it's like nothing has actually happened. And yet, the very thing you always wanted, you actually have. And then it's, you see it even further. The moment you talk of CDF. Yes. The moment you talk about all this, whether it's in GAF fund, all these funds. You're actually saying that the steps that you wished for have actually been actualized. They may not be perfect, but they exist. And so, because of this, we don't actually audit what these units could do, should do, must do. So it's like the counties and the leadership, until the Auditor General comes and flags things and tells us what's happening, they seem to be doing their own things, but not focusing on what... In fact, stealing. In fact, what, what, what I think you said is so right. The problem in Kenya now is obsession with the presidency. That is the problem. It's not, it's not even national government. It's just obsession with the presidency. I've had people, even those who have gone to school from different... We just want our son to be president even for five minutes. Mm. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. We just want our... So until the day... And, and one of the things that we were talking about when we talked about the parliamentary system is to make the presidency unattractive. We even toyed with the idea of a titular presidency like that of India mm. or that of Israel, mm. so that the person who is in charge of daily government is the prime minister, active in parliament. Mm. And I think there is something that when we are talking about constitutional amendment is something that we must just bring on the table. So that what you are saying, if you look at the devolved units and look at the levels of theft and wastage, we don't care. The wastage that we are worried about and the theft that we are worried about is the theft at the center. Mm -hmm. And that is why some of us have always said money follows functions. Mm -hmm. The more you devolve the functions, whether it's health, whether it's education and agriculture, and you sensitize the people, that what will help you if you are in Nyanza or in Western province or in Coast province or Meru is what is being done on the ground. But we don't look at what is being done on the ground. Look mm. at, uh, at, at my own uh, Aboriginal county, Siaya, mm. where a seat is bought for one million. And people are not angry. Mm. People are not angry. He says, mm. it is one of our own who is so stealing. Right. Therefore, he's our thief. This is okay. The one we are worried about is the center. So you are so right that is the tyranny of habit. Yes, mm. you put it so very right. And these are the things that call for serious education. And it's not this, this, this pro forma civic education where you <laughs> call people at halls and you give them an allowance of 1,000, which is what they actually come for. Yeah. But something that is a lot more consistent, a lot more deliberate to liberate them from this tyranny of bad manners. It's just bad manners. Mm. And if we do that, then devolution will begin to make sense. If you go to countries where devolution is working, really the center doesn't even worry. If you go to Switzerland, you ask them the president, they don't know and they don't care mm. because everything is happening around you. When I grew up here in Nairobi and when Nairobi worked before the commissions were being appointed, we really had schools working, health systems working. I never came to town. Why, 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 why was I coming to town? Everything worked, and that yep. is what we needed. Today, 
the parliamentarian, everybody is on your face. When a road is being constructed, you see the image of a politician. Mm -hmm. It's as if it is your own money. I've ever wondered. We are personalizing things done through public funds. And this is the kind of governance that we must do away with. And when we come with this constitutional change, I hope that we will be involved in an intimate way. You know, Professor, the, there's this little concept that mm. can best be referred to as the psychological needs that people actually have. Mm -hmm. And from what you said, it, it outweighs any real needs they may have. Mm -hmm. If somebody would rather listen to a politician pontificating nonsense mm -hmm. and they prefer that to actually challenging the discussion on real progress and development for themselves yes. there is a satisfaction they seem to derive from participating in attending those meetings now <laughs> yes yeah i agree with you the psychological needs then points us to one simple fact that it outweighs any other need somebody may have you'd rather go hungry your children may not even go to school mm. but for some reason you feel that so long as you have participated or you've aligned yourself with this thing that represents a psychological let me let me give it context you s brought in the subject of marginalization yes it is true mm. because of our political configuration there were regions and areas in this country that were neglected mm. but within that discussion mm. comes in when you talk about marginalization what really are you talking about mm. At the dawn of independence, two communities dominated this politics, mm. Luas and Kikuyus. Correct. They literally dominated it. Mm. So Jaramogi moves away. He's no longer in power. Mm. His people are no longer in positions of authority as they were. Now, at that point, have they started treating you like every other Kenyan or are they marginalizing you? Moi <laughs> comes into power mm -hmm. and the Kikuyus say, you know something, we're yeah. being marginalized. So. Yeah. Same question. Are you being treated like everybody else? Or are you being normalized? All right. Yeah, are you just being normalized? Because <laughs> yeah. what you're calling marginalization is what the rest of the Kenyans have been feeling all their lives. Mm. So, which is which? You're talking about marginalization and yet you had roads, you had schools, and there are parts of this country that had none. Absolutely. Still don't. So, mm. this yardstick for marginalization, okay. The committee and the group that you are party to and secretary mm. to understood these things so you bring devolution absolutely we still have the same conversation you know you are so right as you talk i hear you that our problem is actually in the mind yes and and there is something that must be done because this talk of marginalization you hear it even from individuals who are themselves not marginalized but they still are carrying this burden so as you rightly say the whole idea of devolution and and this uh, the funds that we are created to deal with historical injustices was designed to address these issues yes that you trukana it is true that for a time you did not get the things you deserved. You are G were in that position. Mm. So over and above the allocation that we get, we are giving you something additional. Yeah. Mm. But what is it then that we must do? And in my view, it is the architecture of the constitution, among other things, and as I've said, civic education that is going to ensure that this happens so that you are participating in a meaningful way in all critical areas. And what are those critical areas? Years. you are talking about your education mm. you are talking about health you are talking about agriculture you are talking about opportunities in government you are talking about opportunities for invention and invention and innovation and that you are enabled in that regard mm. but and and then certain symbolic things symbolism in the sense that if there is appointment into public office for whatever it's worth you want to see something that we call the face of the nation mm. it that is critical it may not it, mean much but it's critical. It is critical you really want to see that this is a multi-ethnic society so that if you are doing appointment i want to see a kikuyu there i want mm. to see a trukana there i want to see a taita there i want to see a taveta there i want to see a luo there i want to see a kanijin there but and and you don't tell me that that you are having the face of the nation but when i read the kenya gazette it tells me another story mm. so it creates resentment even if you are doing the right thing people don't bother about the right thing they mm -hmm. say oh they are doing the right thing this is not our party so we spoil it if the party is not there and we are not invited, we are going to spoil, going to spoil that, spoil that party. party so that the party does not go on. <laughs> party doesn't go on. <laughs> and, and, and that is the attitude that is you now see in Kenya. Right. Yeah. Because we are not inside the party, 
This I hear some say, we are going to spoil it. We know it is nice. The music is nice. We would have loved it, but we want to be there. And this is what we must do. It's a, it's a simplistic analogy. Let everybody be part of the party. Mm. And, and this administration, in my view, must be given time to serve. But they must have proper communication. They are not communicating well. And that is part of the reason that you have, that when you are dealing with these young countries, we call them young democracies, words must be measured. Arrogance must be debunked. You must be clear in what you say. You must be consistent in what you say. And you must not gloat. You must not humiliate those who appear to be the vanquished. In fact, there must be no vanquished. And once that happens, you mm. discover that the country will have its own conflicts, which will be mediated through the existing institutions, yeah. and we can mediate our conflicts. We are now in a stage, which is an unfort unfortunate stage, where things that we can resolve, we don't want to resolve. We think we need somebody else to resolve it for mm. us. That is a very unfortunate situation. And it weakens our democracy that after every election circle, we cannot mediate our own problems and we have to use extra constitutional avenues yeah. in order to deal with them the mm. question you ask is are we strengthening our democracy in that regard remember the word i love using is governance, governance. we are weakening it by the day because the message we are also sending is that we are incapable of trusting our institution look at the kind of insults that uh, the judiciary is subjected to the legislature is subjected to the presidency is subjected to, I see some young men talking, referring to the president of the Republic of Kenya, the names. I see senior politicians referring to the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. Language, the violence that you see through the spoken word is so intimidating that it weakens. Mm. I may not like the president, I may not like the deputy president, but I will always address the president as the president because he is the one whom the constitutional process has produced. And it is not him that I'm addressing. I'm it's addressing office. that office. And as long as I'm addressing that office, mm. I must respect the current holder of that office. Professor, when you say time mm. is required or the time ought to be given, mm. what do you mean? That this every administration is given a mandate of five years. Mm. It is a marathon. You don't judge a marathon after 100 meters. No, you don't. You don't. Because history has now demonstrated forget these 100 days nonsense we know the history of it after the american uh, after after, after the, the american problems uh, during the days of roosevelt we know history now tells us and research tells us that it takes any government 18 days 18 months to settle that is when it has settled that is when it has dealt with the baggages of the former administration this administration has been there for slightly under one year and the promises they made, they made, they would deliver after five years. I want to judge them after five years. Some of the things that are being done will only mature in the third year. So when I talk about giving them time to deliver, to deliver within their mandate. And if I was a communicator for them, mm. I would say so. How many budgets have they read, for example, because all these things are based on budget reallocation. They have only done one budget since they came into power. And when they talked about roads, when they talked about agriculture, when they talked about education, they need the full mandate. But you see, Professor, yeah. they keep this conversation alive. Yes. They made election promises. And we believe election promises are just that, election promises. Yes. But they got into power and continued the promises. That is so, why I'm talking about communication. Yes. That they, they are not communicating. When you get... When I'm, you I'm, arguing that, I'm arguing that they are communicating. They keep telling no, us. No, they communicate very badly. In my view. <laughs> How? How so? Because <laughs> you know, they keep reminding us of They're speaking, promises. but they're not communicating. No, no, no. You know, no. communication is about... Is <laughs> when, when you get into governance, and, and if it's like courtship. Mm. During courtship, you say many things. Oh, you say very you, many things. But yes. when you settle into the reality, <laughs> you, now, you now discover there is rent to be paid. <laughs> there are bills to be paid. It is no longer... You can no longer go to the restaurant every day. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, the, and this is what the government ought to be telling us uh, not, not this uh, 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 a pie in the sky there's still too many pies in the sky which which were being promised mm. and if i were them i would set look 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 uh, my brother yesterday 
I watched a cabinet minister yes. saying that uh, she had sucked a police officer. <laughs> yeah. And she is the minister for the time being, or the cabinet secretary for the time being in charge of health. Yeah. Yes. How can she possibly say that? And she, are there not she rules? Say it. She can say yeah. it. Yeah. How she can say it? <laughs> how can she possibly say? And and there are rules and regulations that deal with hiring and firing. Mm. And this is what communication is all about. Mm. And and uh, when you get into governance, and all of us have been in institutions. When you get into institutions, you now deal with the reality. You now make your minister for foreign affairs say the right thing, minister for trade say the right thing, minister for agriculture say the right thing. The president rarely speaks, possibly can have an audience with this country every one, one month or one week in the early days, one week through radio addresses. Nyerere used to do it perfectly. Mm. One week he speaks to the nation as he settles in office, he reduces it to one month. Kagame does it perfectly. And Museveni also does it perfectly when you now want to speak on the grand agenda you call the press and all your cabinet is there and they speak to the nation that is what i particularly in a divided nation such as ours mm. communication is critical but, and sound communication but should we then not listen to what we are being told because if we have leaders who we believe have an understanding have advisors mm -hmm. we cannot say they're not advised or they don't have inadequacy of advisors but then we also can't ignore what they keep saying because then are they not telling us exactly we'll hang them by what they say so, yes because they, 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 they're the ones who keep saying every time i open my mouth to speak i'm cognizant of the fact that i have the option of not speaking yeah okay yeah but if i persist in speaking then that is the mode i have chosen to go about my business but brother muga what i do as yes. a person who, who i consider myself to be responsible in a civic way yes. i write there is nobody I don't write to, whether mm. it's the governor of Nairobi, whether it's NTSA, you have a whole file. Mm. Because I consider it my civic responsibility, right? I write to the speaker. They don't respond. I write to minister. <laughs> minister for Education does respond. Mm. That does. one does respond. Even the Minister for Health responds. And this you, one I'm, who's firing. This one who yeah, yeah she OCS. responds. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. She responds to letters. Okay. And to me, civic responsibility is about raising these issues. So mm. whenever you see me in Kenya complaining publicly, mm -hmm. I'll have complained quietly. So I don't just come out shouting. Mm. I'll give you the, the opportunity to say, this is what I think. These are my suggestions. This tech for example this democracy that we are talking about on the first of march i was one of the very first few kenyans to write to both the president and the leader of the opposition mm. warning about the deaths that have now taken place mm. warning about the destruction that has now taken place but now they are going back to the very same place that we said avoid, deaths. avoid this mm. Yeah. Mm. they can not so our civic responsibility is about correcting them Look at about the four power, even in foreign affairs, when we made that major mistake about Morocco and Polisario. <laughs> so when you talk about advice, Buga, it's, it's true. You have been you 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 advise people, but do they take it? <laughs> is, do they have the courage? Because the ability to take advice is also humility. Yeah. When you are arrogant, you begin to think you know everything, and there is no shortage of individuals in Kenya who think they have the monopoly of ideas and knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs> Come again soon and let's have thank this conversation. You. Asante, you, sir. Asante. <laughs> Professor P. L. Lumumba, what do you do now? Apart from writing oh, to I'm the CSA, very active in yeah. practice. Mm. Of my practice, of still my foundation. A lot, right? Our foundation is present in 50 African countries, mm -hmm. working with young men and women, mentoring them. So we are active. Very good. Yeah. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.